Okay, so just touching on services procurement in a bit more detail. Um, in terms of your your career, how much of how much of your interactions would you say have been on the services side versus kind of like the goods and materials supply chain? That's a great question. I mean, it, you know, I spent um, almost fifteen years in telecoms, and um, you know, you'd think that that's a lot of heavy lifting, um, physical infrastructure, which indeed it is. But even telecoms businesses have increasingly pivoted their supply chains more to services you know and software um, um, and, and things like that so I've seen a, a, a big transition away from just a, a fully focused hardware um, and physical supply chain into one that has a much uh, bigger mix of services so um, just to give you some examples you know it wasn't so long ago that telco businesses would build their own networks mm -hmm. so you needed you needed the engineering organization but you then needed vans you needed all of the ancillary equipment and then you needed to buy the network network kit that went with it well you know I, most telco businesses these days whilst they may still buy the uh, if you talk about the mobile operators the radio access network equipment for example they're not deploying it they're buying a suite of services that deploys um that capacity for them so that's a just a very obvious example but one to signal how even a business like telecoms which you think is all hardware is actually pivoting to um a world where it, it's a lot more services um and, and again you know um in billing which is always a, a big topic in telco you know 80 percent of that spend these days is services you know people billing customizing billing engines and building new capabilities within the the infrastructure that the telcos have bought so you know, I think, um, and, and I would say, do I think that services procurement is as sophisticated as maybe uh, physical? Well, I think there's still an awful lot, long way to go. Um, and there's so, it's, it, it's such an interesting area as well, because, you know, um, think about it, you know, if, you, if you're buying um, labour related services these days, how comfortable do we feel as a procurement profession striking a bargain where we've reduced costs on a like for like basis, knowing full well that, you know, people don't necessarily get living wages um, and things like that. So that, that's where I think this fusion of um, how you think about running your supply chain and simultaneously diversity inclusion becomes super, super important because you can't, you can't build commercial relationships knowing that people aren't getting um, a living wage these days, in my view. Why? Because not only is it the wrong thing to do, but you don't build sustainable relationships with those suppliers. You know, oftentimes they have the highest levels of turn turnover, the worst levels of quality, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where you know, I just think the sophistication of our sourcing methodologies around services can be so important in the future. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've if you look at services procurement, I've I've heard it you know, people within the industry, within procurement, talk about it just being left behind from a technology perspective, even compared to areas like contingent workforce. Yeah. And ultimately, it's a, it's a tricky problem to solve. It's complicated. You know, services are all different. The way that they're, you, you can't just compare price on a like for like basis. Um, but, but I think to your point that you were making there about um, cost cutting, um, that is a really that's a really thorny issue in services procurement in my view because if you're addressing cost cutting then you absolutely have those issues that you just mentioned um and you need to understand what's going on in your supplier but you also need to understand what you're getting for it mm. because the idea of cost cutting we spent 100 million last year we need to we need to reduce costs to make it 90 million this year that takes that in no way does that take into account what the return is from the delivery of those services. You're getting some great consulting, some great outsourced service delivery, all kinds of specialist services being delivered into the business. What's that driving in the business? And I think that's again, ties into this strategic role of procurement where if procurement professionals can really understand their services spend and really understand which suppliers are doing a great job for them and where they're really adding value, then actually it might make sense for the business to spend more on services procurement because- Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I've seen good examples and, and uh, poor examples. I think where, where the best examples work is where procurement really have a clear understanding of what the value proposition is of the services they're buying 
um, and how they lead to kind of tangible outcomes for the business. If you can, if you can really work that, then I think, as you say, um, you just become more sophisticated about thinking about um, what you're buying. And then, then it's not frankly a unit rate discussion. It's no. actually what is the scope of the service that you're buying? Um, and um, do you need to expand the scope or reduce the scope? Um, um, do you need to um, give the opportunity for suppliers to, to move into other areas of things that they may not have done historically, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, it just gives you more bandwidth to have, a, I think, a richer conversation. Um, the other thing I think we've got to get more comfortable with and just perfect is how do you productize services as well? Um, you know, I, I think in truth, there's a lot of repetition in terms of what we buy. And I think one of the things that we're trying to figure out in Kantar with some of the services that we buy is how do we productize it so we can make it more uniform um, and, and in doing so um, have a much clearer uh, relationship between the outcome of the things that we're, we're, sorry, the things that we're buying and the outcomes that it delivers. And then we talked a little bit about systems. I mean, then suddenly your systems landscape becomes a lot clearer to run and operate as well because you're productizing services. So therefore things like your material master data and your records and all those things become a lot clearer to navigate and manage. Um, and as I say, you know, it comes back to the fact that I think that um, services procurement needs to be on a bit of an accelerated journey, I think, in terms of how it becomes more sophisticated in the future. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. And ultimately it comes, it comes down to data again. Yeah. Um, comes down to understanding the information but I, I also something that I really love about um, just where, where organizations can get on top of this data and and understand what they're getting from from the services that they buy is it forces the organization to think strategically mm. it forces them at the top level to say where are we going what are we doing what's important and it and, and it requires appropriate communication of that, to all parts of the business. So that every stakeholder within a business who's procuring services, you know, when you're delivering to outcomes, you need to know where you're going, what the, what yeah. the outcome needs to be. And this, the, I think COVID has really driven a shift towards outcome-based work and it increased the importance and shone a light on services procurement in some ways, because A, working to budget isn't good enough anymore. You know, you need to, if we're spending 200 million on services, well, can someone tell me what we got for that, please? Because at the moment, all I can see is, that we spent it with these companies in these dates. I don't even know what the projects were, whether they were on time, whether they delivered value, whether they were any good. Um, so it forces um, it forces the whole organisation to gear themselves towards what the outcome is. But the other thing COVID has done is it's it's increased the acceptance of outsourced work delivery, remote work delivery, um, and actually, if you've got even if you've got your own staff working remotely and working from home it does kind of drive that output agenda a little bit more because if somebody's working from home and they've got childcare requirements or, you know, they're homeschooling during COVID, then actually to a certain extent, it doesn't really matter how they're working or maybe not even when they're working. It's all about, are they doing a good job? Are they getting what they need to do done? And are they doing it on time? Um, so it's, it, COVID has it's definitely had a big um, kind of a big influence on, the, this kind of transformation within services procurement. Um, but coming back to what you said about um, the kind of standardization and productization of services, you know, clearly within complex services, there are going to be certain areas that are going to be within an organization a bit more cookie cutter. Mm. I mean, we see things where people are using, for example, um, requirements templates yeah. and things like that, which may have some variation around them, but ultimately using the right technology you know, you can standardize things like that and procurement can guide it, but you can also standardize things like contracts. Yeah. But, but the only way that you can move forward with, um, with these, this type of spend is to actually capture that process and capture the granularity because it again, it comes back to the data. Um, I mean, when, when you're looking at standardizing, standardizing requirements, how are you, how are you addressing that in terms of looking back at, at, at requirements that you've had before and, is it, is it a business question that you're asking stakeholders or is it something where you're trying to interrogate the kind of previous performance and, and delivery? Yeah, I mean, it's inter I mean, we, our, our business is it has so many different components to it. Um, our big insights business has a lot of what we call customization, together with a lot of 
um, services that deliver um, annuity revenues. On the um, customised business, she's basically um, individual projects that get commissioned by the big brands around the world. Um, some of the things that we're looking at at the moment is, you know, within the multitude of individual commissions that we um, initiate, is there enough commonality that at a project level it looks random and variable, but as a quantum in terms of a volume level, if you look across all of it, is there enough consistency there that we can begin to start streamlining that and, as you say, create templates um, and standardizations so that with the end result, the, the, the journey between customers commissioning things and our ability to execute that within the supply chain becomes a lot quicker um, and a lot smoother and, and delivering, you know, um, a simplified process will also greatly aid the quality of what it is that we provide to our clients. So, you know, we're, we're looking at that and, and, and it, you know, it's thirsty work, you know, you have to do a lot of data crunching to get into it to kind of really understand what, what it is that's there and what the data is telling you. Now, it, it's greatly aided by the fact that we, we are investing heavily in our um, supply chain data, um, improving all of our material master management, um, our onboarding processes, our reporting and all that kind of stuff. Um, and in doing so, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that we'll begin to start seeing a lot of um, patterns to what we buy that will then aid us in terms of simplifying what we do.